good morning. Hey, happy Easter, everybody. Let's uh, uh, go to the Lord in a word of prayer, and then we're going to dive into the scripture, and man, God is going to do something amazing this morning. We've already seen him working. He's already moving, and uh, guys, it is going to be incredible as we celebrate our resurrected Jesus today. Uh, but you know, we actually get to do that every day of the week, every day of the year, so do not wait until this one day to do it. Because our Jesus is alive every day. Let's celebrate him for that. Father, thank you so much for this time you've given us today to dive into your word, to celebrate you together. Uh, God, just to get our focus fixed back in you. Because you are the author and the finisher of our salvation. You're the one who's begun it. You're the one who's going to end it. You're the one who equips and empowers us along the way. And Jesus, today we celebrate your resurrection, your victory. And God, we just seek our way into you, to celebrate this, to honor this, to live this victory that you've given to us by your spirit. And God, I pray that today as we do get into the word here, that you open our understanding. Father, that you speak to our heart and by your spirit draw us near. Forgive us, convict us, compel us to go out and live for you in this life so that we are uh, an accurate representation of the life of Jesus Christ so that the world may know and be saved. For Father, we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Could you guys have imagined 2,000-ish years ago, living and having been one of his disciples, walking with him, talking with him, watching him raise the dead, feed the 5,000. I mean, how does one fish split into two? But it did, and it fed 5,000 men besides women and children, this little basket of fish and loaves he had. You watched him do it. You saw him heal the lame. You watched him. And then you watched him die. You watched him die as the Passover lamb was being slain as well. And now he's dead. Could you imagine how those disciples felt? I mean, betrayed maybe? Let down? Broken? Defeated? However it may have been. But but something else is going to happen. Because throughout the Old Testament, all the way through this thing, as we've been talking the last couple of weeks, God has been constantly reminding the people, somebody's coming. Somebody's going to do something. We call him Messiah. And when the Messiah comes, he will do great things. He'll set the people free. He'll rule over the, uh, over the kingdom of David from David's throne. That's what Messiah is going to do. And he's going to inaugurate a kingdom that is greater than anything man has ever seen or known. That's Messiah. He'll do great things. And all of history, from the Garden of Eden, all through the end of time, has been centered on the climax of that Messiah's ministry, his resurrection from the dead. And that's what we're here today to talk about, guys. I mean, the scripture says um, that Jesus rose from the dead. Henry Morris says the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the crowning proof of Christianity. If the resurrection did not take place, then Christianity is a false religion. If it did take place, then Christ is God and the Christian faith is absolute truth. And that's where it puts Christianity. There is no in-between. Either Jesus is a dead heretic or he is God. There is no in-between. And if he is raised from the dead, then everything he ever taught, everything he ever said, everything he ever did has been validated and is now the most important thing on this planet because as the scripture teaches, we live because he lives. We are freed from our sin because he lives. Right? We have life and purpose and meaning and forgiveness and restoration with God. We're brought back into his fellowship. Why? Because Jesus lives. How do we know? I mean, yeah, sure, Jesus rose from the dead, okay? Another sermon for another day, but uh, maybe next Easter, because apparently we only get to talk about the resurrection at Easter. But uh, anyway, it's another sermon for another day, but... uh, The resurrection of Jesus is the most attested to fact in the history of our planet. Okay, I don't have time to get into it today because we do want lunch eventually next week. All right, so we don't have to get into all the the details there. But how do we know that just because Jesus rose from the dead, how do we know that means we get to rise from the dead one day? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, how do we know? I mean, how do we put our faith in the fact that Jesus rose, therefore I'm good? 
Jesus rose, therefore my sins are forgiven. Jesus rose, therefore I get to put my hope in a resurrection that I'll get to have one day. How do we know that? Well, again, Easter eggs. God isn't dropping new things on them right here. He has been introducing these concepts all through the Old Testament. And the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at instances in the Old Testament that show us what Jesus is going to do and how the gospel is at work even back in that time period. So uh, again, what we're going to do today, we're going to look at something from the Old Testament, and then we're going to move to the new and see how Jesus fulfills it. Then we're going to see what that's got to do with us. Okay, so that's our trajectory in these uh, Easter egg sermons. Last week, we talked about the tabernacle in Israel and how that foreshadowed Christ and how literally everything about this thing pointed to Jesus and how he's the fulfillment, how we worship God in him. We live in God in Christ. Today, we go to everybody's favorite uh, Easter text, Leviticus 23. All right, so uh, go to the book of Leviticus chapter 23. Some of you already just tuned me out when I said Leviticus. Is anybody psychologically damaged by my word Leviticus? <laughs> yeah, Leviticus is one of those books that uh, I'm just going to be blunt with you. It's boring to read, but it is fascinating to study. It's like a whole different ball game when you start looking at what it's about. Yeah, you read it if you need to go to sleep. You study it if you want to know Jesus more. That's the idea here. So we get to this point, and we have a festival. It's one of those you kind of don't hear a lot about because we get to the Easter season, and what's the big Jewish festival we all think about? Passover. I didn't want to pass over that one. I wanted to acknowledge it. And we, it was Passover, right? We were, when, when God saved Egypt or Israel out of Egypt and he brought them out by a mighty hand, he uh, slaughtered the firstborn, brought Israel out, let them cross the Red Sea, that whole thing, man, that's exciting. However, when it comes to Easter and celebrating the resurrection of Jesus, we really need to be thinking about a different festival, the festival of the first fruits. That's where we need to go, and that's where we're going today. Now, first fruits was a... Um, it was kind of part of the whole Passover unleavened bread celebration. Some people want to say it was a separate uh, festival. Some people want to say, no, it's just part of the whole thing. But here's what happened. Let's go to Leviticus 23. We'll read it starting in verse 9. Leviticus 23, 9. It says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, say to them, When you come into the land that I'll give you and reap its harvest, you shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord so that you may be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And on the day when you wave the sheaf, you shall offer a male lamb a year, a year without blemish and as a burnt offering to the Lord. And the grain offering with it shall be two-tenths of an ephah, of fine flour mixed with oil, a food offering to the Lord with a pleasing aroma. And the drink offering with it shall be of wine and a fourth of a hen. And those are Jewish measurements. Don't get too caught up on them. Okay, a hen is like a, a fourth of a hen is like a quart. Okay. And you shall eat neither bread nor grain, parched or fresh, until the same day, uh, until this same day, until you have brought the offering of your God. It is a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. What is he talking about? <laughs> Well, what's happening up until now in Scripture, we've been reading a lot about meat offerings, right? I mean, you bring the lamb, you bring the goat, you bring the bull, you know, we've got these, uh, these meat offerings, and you might be tempted to think, wait, God doesn't like veggies. No, God likes veggies very much. You say, then wait, why did he reject Cain's offering? Ha, 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 ha. Okay, that's relevant, believe it or not. <laughs> because if you actually go and do this later, go to Genesis chapter 4, you read about where Abel and his brother Cain, they brought offerings to the Lord. Remember this? And it says that Abel brought of the first of his flock, and he brought of the fat of it. That means the best parts, right? Contrary to those skinny people, the fat is the best part. And he brings it in, and he lays it out before the Lord as the offering. Then it says Cain brought of his vegetables. Not the best, not the first, not that. So it's not that God didn't like the veggies, it's that he didn't like Cain's heart, and also Cain didn't bring the best. He didn't bring his first fruits. He just brought the leftovers. And that's very tempting to do because um, how do you know that you're going to ever have any again? 
And that's what first fruits is all about. What they would do at this festival, it took place on the third day after the Passover lamb was killed. Hold on to that. And what would happen in the first, uh, with the first fruits, they would go out and they'd get the sheaves and they'd, they'd gather up the first bunch, the very first things. Usually in their land, it was barley, okay, that would so, uh, show up first. And they'd take this barley, they'd bunch it all together, and they'd bring it to the priest. The priest would take the best of this as a sheaf, and he would begin to wave it before the Lord, okay? What he's doing here is he's presenting this to God as the first fruits offering. Uh, later, the scripture is going to call it the wave offering. They pull it up and they say, here you go, God, the very first of what we've got. And then they weren't allowed. Here's the big part. They then were not allowed to eat any more of that harvest until 50 days later on the festival of Pentecost. Okay, that's when they would be able to uh, eat the rest of this thing. Why? Picture this. You've got a crop. You don't know if the rest of it's coming in later or not but yet you have to bring it to the Lord and offer it to him. Because this was a trust offering. This was a thing to say, okay, God, I see this. I'm going to gather this. I'm going to bring it to you and trust that you will bring the rest of it to pass. Could we do that? I mean, have you ever, you ever guys, when you're grilling, you know what I'm talking about, and you've already spotted the one you want? You know what I mean by that? Ladies, you do the same thing when you grill or cook or whatever you're doing you do the same thing you're like oh the, the grill marks are just perfect on this one this is the one i want i mean i'm going to throw another burger on here but i doubt it's going to be as perfect as this one <laughs> israel's having the same issue they've got to bring this to god in a trust and they offer it to god in a trust the very first things now if you've ever had a garden maybe you have a garden now you know as well as i do just because those first tomatoes come in plump right and juicy does not mean the rest of them are going to right? And this is what Israel's having to do. They're having to present this to the Lord and say, okay, God, I know you're going to bring the rest of it. That's why I'm dedicating this one to you. I know the rest of the harvest will come. And then 50 days later, they would celebrate Pentecost, which was the giving of the law. And also this whole thing would come in and, and the fullness of what just happened would come at Pentecost. That's the festival of the first fruits, right? Kind of a thing. Um, so what's that got to do with anything? Well, a lot. If you go with me now, we're going to change Bible verses here. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is interesting. 1 Corinthians 15. Think about the trust Israel had to do here. Israel's brought their first fruit offering. They've given it to God in anticipation that the rest of the offering will come, or the rest of the uh, grain will come. And here's what Paul says. He's teaching the church at Corinth. He's reminding them about the reality of the resurrection. And then he gets down to verse 20. And he says this. He says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits. Then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule, every authority, and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Hang on. Paul connects the first fruit offering with the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus does too. In John chapter 12, the Greeks come seeking Jesus. That's the, the Gentile people, me and you. Unless you're Jew, then you're not a Greek. But if you're a Jew, you're a Jew. And if you're not, you're a Greek. That's the way they looked at it. So the Greeks come to Jesus, and, or they come to Philip, actually. And they're like, hey, uh, can we go see Jesus? So they come and get Jesus. And he goes, okay, this is my hour. The Gentiles are seeking me out. And then he tells them this. He gives this cryptic phrase in John chapter 12, uh, along about verse 20. He says, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it goes into the ground and it dies, is that seed, I'm elaborating on what he said here, it grows and it yields so much more fruit. And he says, that's what I'm about to do. You see, here's the idea. Paul says that Jesus is God's first fruits. And just like as Israel brought their first fruits to the Lord and he accepted and promised the rest of the harvest, just like that, Jesus is the evidence that the harvest is coming. Jesus is the evidence that the resurrection is real and it is coming. He is a pledge. His resurrection is the wheat 
harvest pledge of our resurrection. It's inevitable, given by Christ himself. All those who belong to Christ will share in this resurrection. He is the offering that proves the harvest is coming. That's how he's the first fruits. He's raised from the dead. He presented himself alive to the Father as that offering. And today, just as Israel would take that offering and say, okay, God, we're laying this before you. We know the harvest is coming. We're putting our faith in that. Today, we look at our resurrected Jesus and we say, you know what? I see him raised. That's my hope and my faith. He's the first fruits. We are still to come. We put our life and our hope in him alone. Now, how does that accomplish anything regarding first fruits, Joey? I mean, what's that? What does that mean for us? If Jesus is indeed raised and he's promising that because he's alive, we're going to be alive too, and you see that in the first fruit offering, what does that mean for us? What does it mean for us today? I mean, how do we tap into this? I mean, they weren't allowed to, to eat of the grain until, you know, Pentecost comes. Right, what's that mean for us? What do we do in the meantime? Well, let's look at what it does mean. I'll give you three things that means for us today first our faith is not in vain that's what it means our faith is not in vain have you ever felt that your faith is just empty that you you ever do this dance and we're we're coming to church and we're smiling together we're singing together and we're getting in the word together and then when you have tough days we just kind of go well god's got a plan and we do all these things have you ever wondered is it really making a difference in your life is it really impacting you at all well, empty, vain means in this case, it doesn't mean arrogant, it means empty or to no avail. It means useless, without purpose. Back up in 1 Corinthians 15 to verse 12, okay? Paul's making an argument here. Remember, he's telling these people, yes, Jesus is raised. Here's what he says in verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there's no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection from the dead, if there's no resurrection from the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We're even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it's true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ hasn't been raised, your faith is futile, you're still in your sins, and then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we're of all people most to be pitied. <laughs> Look what he's arguing. He's doing what we call arguing from the negative here. Okay, he's saying if this isn't true, then this isn't true either as a way of saying, but it is. All right? He's saying if there's no resurrection from the dead, but there is, but if there was no resurrection from the dead, your faith's in vain. But there is a resurrection from the dead, therefore your faith is not in vain. If the resurrection didn't happen, then our preaching's in vain. But the resurrection did happen, therefore our preaching is not in vain. The work we do for God is not in vain. The faith we put in him is not empty and to no purpose. He even goes on to say, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, we're misrepresenting God. We're guilty of blasphemy. However, <laughs> we present Christ as raised. That is the highest call of the Christian. It is the way we best represent God is to say Christ is raised. Why? Because that's the crowning achievement. You know, a lot of times we reduce Christianity to just being a good person or just being a good citizen or just being nice or just being, and those are good things to do. But that's not what Christianity is. Christianity is the proclamation that Jesus is alive that our sins have been forgiven. The gospel message that Christ died and rose, that's our faith. And guys, it is not in vain. We talked about the disciples and their despair. Remember that? How they must have felt in that time between the crucifixion and the resurrection. How they felt empty, they felt they had followed this guy and now it's all over, maybe they're gonna die next. Yeah, I get their despair. Church, we don't have their excuse. We have a resurrected Jesus. The first fruits offering is already there. 
We don't have the excuse to do this. Hebrews 11 tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We put our faith in what Jesus Christ has already done, and the resurrection is the proof. The resurrection is the proof of all things, everything. It validates the entirety of Scripture. It validates our life in Him. God is progressing His agenda throughout history, and nothing can and will stop it, so nothing we do in faith can or will fail. Despair is not a fruit of the Spirit. Fear is not a fruit of the Spirit. We put our faith and our hope in Jesus. And our hope extends beyond this life alone. Christian, I know times are tough, but your faith is not in vain. Because we have a risen Jesus. The first fruits already before the Father. So our faith is not in vain. Secondly, Our resurrection is certain. Not only is your faith not in vain, but your resurrection is certain. Not iffy, certain. Look at verse 20 again. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man also has come the resurrection of the dead. In Adam all die, so in Christ all are made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to him. Huh. Our resurrection's certain. Remember I told you I'd put a pen in Pentecost, right? Pen in Pentecost. Yeah, okay. Put the pen in Pentecost for a second. What happened on the day of Pentecost after Jesus rose from the dead? The Holy Spirit fell. The Holy Spirit fell. At the giving of the law, which was the celebration of Pentecost, 3,000 were dead. They were killed. Why? Because Moses came down from the Mount Sinai. He comes down. They're worshiping false gods. They're doing all this manner of stuff. Moses became the biggest sinner in the Bible, broke all ten commandments at once. Remember, the tablets all fell down, shattered. And then they they came down here, and they, long story short, 3,000 people were killed when the law was given. Fast forward to the New Testament, Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit comes also at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit falls, and Peter preaches the gospel. And you know how many people are made alive at the coming of the Holy Spirit? The Bible says about 3,000, you know? At the giving of the law, 3,000 made dead. At the preaching of the Spirit, 3,000 made alive. It's a reversal of death. That's what we celebrate. And remember, the first fruit offering says the fullness is going to come at the Pentecost. Jesus told them in Luke 24, he says, I'm going back to the Father. Wait here until I send my Spirit. In John 16, he tells them, he says, when I go to the Father, I will send the Spirit. And he's going to come. And he's going to do so many great things through you. That's what he told them. And then the Spirit falls at Pentecost as they're waiting for the fullness of the first fruits. You see, the fact that the Spirit came shows us that Jesus made it to the Father. Because he said, when I get to the Father, I'll send the Spirit. And the Spirit came, and the Spirit is with us. What's the effect here? There's another life. There's another life we live for. Church, don't get bogged down in this one. Don't get so messed up and so concerned and so engulfed in this life. What if we were as concerned about eternity and eternal things as we are the here and now and the here and now things? What if we were that concerned? What if we looked at other people and we did not see them as political opponents or we did not see them as as cultural enemies, but we saw them as people for whom Christ died? What if we could get back to that point? You see, the resurrection calls us to this because everybody, they're, they're gonna live forever, whether it's in heaven or hell, we've got eternal life. And church, we have the mission. (laughs) It's been said that immortality is the glorious discovery of Christianity. Immortality. Why? Because we're going to live. And the scripture says here, Christ has been raised. And then at his coming, all those who belong to Jesus will also be raised. (laughs) So what's that do for us today? It gives us patience. Because we await a better resurrection. You know, I think about those guys in uh, Hebrews chapter 11. I kind of started that a little while ago with the, you know, faith is the substance of things hoped for, evidence things not seen. But you go through that chapter and you get the heroes of the faith, man. You get Abraham doing his thing and then you got it, Samson coming in. In fact, the writer of Hebrews runs out of room, okay? He only had so much uh, uh, paper. So he started going, I can't, I don't even have time to tell you about Samson or Barak or these other guys. And then he went on to the list of the martyrs saying that there were those who were burned. There were those who were fed to the the beast. There were those who were sawn in half. 
And then he says the world wasn't even worthy of those people. Why? Because they traded their life here in hope of a better resurrection to come. Christian, I'm not telling you to throw out your life. What I am telling you is to get your perspective right. Because we do not live for here alone. We live for eternity. <laughs> live for that eternity. Hold on. What you're going through right now is only temporary. Hold on. Death is overcome in the resurrection. In Christ, we have nothing to fear in death, nothing to regret in life, because such is the power of his resurrection. And we live. <laughs> Church, we are not people of death. We are people of life. And we live as people of life. <laughs> I like Romans chapter 6. I'm going to read this to you. Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 4. He says, we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into his death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we've been united with him in death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in his resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Guys, we have a different life. A life that's growing into him. A life that's moving into him. And you say, Joey, I get that, man. One day I'm going to die and be with Jesus. That's awesome, but what about now? Paul says live for him now. Death doesn't stain him anymore. He's sustaining us by his life. Joey, why do I fall back so much? What, why do I, what do I do? Why do I just give up? Don't give up. Because in Christ, our faith's not in vain. In Christ, our resurrection is certain. And lastly, in Christ, our salvation will be completed. Our salvation will be completed. God didn't start a work in you just to give it up. Go back with me to 1 Corinthians 15. Let's go back to verse 23 again. He says, but each in his own order, you know, being made alive, Christ the first fruits, then it is coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, where he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and every power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Okay, stop there. Our salvation is going to be completed. You say, Joey, why isn't it completed yet? Because <laughs> the harvest isn't finished yet. People are still being saved. You know, the harvest is not yet done. The Spirit of God is the down payment of this. Jesus is being waved before the Father as the first fruit offering, and the Pentecost fullness has come, showing that, yes, the harvest is being gleaned, the harvest is being grown. That means uh, the Spirit abiding in you is evidence that you are part of, the, of this thing, the Spirit in you. Now, I'm going to meddle for just a second, because here's the reality of this. I do not care if you're a member of a church or not. I don't care if you're a good person or not. I don't care if you've done all these things or not. The question as to whether or not you're participating in the resurrection is, does the Holy Spirit dwell in you? That's the question. Has your life been transformed by the teaching of the gospel? Have you committed to follow Jesus? <laughs> the fruit of the Spirit is a transformed life. Remember the first fruits? It represents the fullness of the harvest. And they'd bring in the barley because it was usually the first thing to, uh, to grow, right? The first thing to, to produce and mature. It represented the mature crop, the one to come. Jesus is our first fruits, and he represents the maturity of the faith. This is why Paul says in places like Ephesians and other spots that we are growing into maturity into the one head, Jesus Christ. We're growing to look like him. We're growing to be him. See, here's the point. A seed can only grow into what the seed is of. You don't plant corn and grow strawberries. You don't plant peas and grow tomatoes, right? The seed only becomes what it is. And at the end of the age that he references here, then comes the end. The scripture says the angels of God will go out with a sickle. And you know what they do? They harvest the earth. Words carefully chosen. There's a harvest. 
a harvest of the wheat that is molded in him and following after the first fruits, part of his resurrection. And then there's another gleaning for those who are doomed to damnation, thrown into a devil's hell for all eternity because they rejected this message. What makes the difference, whether you're part of the harvest or part of the burning, is Christ the first fruits. What have you done with Jesus? That's the point. And he goes on to say this. He says, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. After destroying every rule, every authority, every power, he's going to reign until he's put his enemies under his footstool. And the last enemy to be destroyed is going to be death. Here's the point. You didn't save yourself. You're not going to keep yourself saved. That is in Christ. We put our faith in him as the first fruits. But also, right now, sometimes it's going to look like you're finished. Sometimes we, despite our best efforts, we fall back into that sin. We do the same thing again. We come to God and we say, God, I'll never do it again. And then guess what happens the next time we have time or opportunity? We do it again. Christ is putting down the enemy as we speak. Your sin is defeated. Your sin is defeated. The separation between us and God is closed. And one day, Jesus will put down death itself when that harvest has fully come. But here's the thing. Yes, sometimes we seem defeated. Sometimes we want to throw in the towel. But the fact that our faith is not in vain and our resurrection is guaranteed leads us to this point to see that our faith and our maturity and this Christian life, the fruit of the Spirit, our holiness, our salvation will one day be completed as well. I've told you this before, but when you cook biscuits, you start with the dough, you put it in the oven, and you let the biscuits start, you know, cooking. And one day they're going to be biscuits. One day they're going to be buttery, good, golden biscuits that need a whole bunch of gravy. But until they're done, they're not biscuits yet. They're somewhere in the middle. <laughs> they're still turning. You see parts that look really good, and you see parts that are still doughy. Some of us are still a little doughy. But the reality is they're going to complete. Because Jesus is alive, so are you. So are you. So how do we connect to this resurrection power? How do we grab onto it and make it our own? Because Paul says here we can. He says the fact that Christ has been raised, we see it in the first fruit offering. Therefore, we know the harvest is coming. What do we do in the meantime? How do we, how do we hold on? First, I want you to celebrate your life in relation to his. Celebrate your life in relation to his. What do you mean? Jo yeah, times are tough, but my Jesus is alive. Yeah, I'm hurting right now, but my Jesus is alive because that's where we pin all hope and we celebrate the things in our life because we know Jesus is alive. Do not misunderstand what I'm, just about, what I'm about to say. Jesus is his death and resurrection serves as a parable for us. Yes, it really happened. Like I said, don't misunderstand me. Jesus died, Jesus rose. That's the whole base of our faith. But what I mean is we learn from that, sometimes it looks like death wins. Sometimes it looks like hardships are gonna always be. But Jesus taught us, no, you die in order to live. And today we celebrate our lives only in relation to his because he lives because we see that today, we don't have to drown in our despair. We don't have to give up hope. No matter what's coming in your life, if you really do believe he's the first fruit, and you really do believe the harvest is coming, and you really do believe that your faith is not in vain, and you really do believe your resurrection is certain, and you really do believe that your salvation will be complete one day, then you never have to groan at what's going on in your life. Because the hand of Almighty God is working from death to resurrection in you. Celebrate that. And secondly, commit your life to relationship with him. Commit your life to relationship with him. Like Paul told us in Romans, he says, if you claim this God is yours, then you live for him. If you claim to have this resurrection, then you live in this resurrection. See, a lot of times we try to, I don't know, we still try to earn our faith. You know what I mean by that? We try to earn that salvation. We, we base whether we feel saved or not on, am I being a good Christian this week? 
You know, did I read my Bible right? Did I share my faith? Did I, did I help somebody that was uh, uh, struggling with their faith? Am I shining? Am I perfect? Is my house in order? Is my, you know, we have all these things. That's trying to wave us before the Father. And we're not the first fruit offering. He is. You wave your Jesus before the Father and say, Jesus, this is, this, he's already done the work. He's made it right. He's done what's necessary. And you commit yourself to a relationship with him. Guys, Easter, if nothing else, it means that God got into our mess, our sin, our brokenness, our mess. He made it his own. And he beat it like it stole something. Because <laughs> it did steal something. It stole us. And he's gotten us back. Jesus said in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I overcame the world. In the world you will have hardship, but I've overcome the world. I love that. I read this quote today, actually, this morning. It says, God weeps with us so that we may one day laugh with him. Guys, like I said, we're not a people of death. We're a people of life. We're a people who are alive unto our God because Jesus lives. Don't miss that. Hold on to him. And you see that gospel message in the first fruit offering. What is the gospel message? I never want to take it for granted that you know what I mean when I say the gospel. Because whether you go to heaven or hell depends on whether you will believe this gospel. And we need, to know what we, we need to know what it is. The gospel message says that we are lost in our sin. That we all like sheep have gone astray. We've all sinned and gone our own way. We've broken God's law. Failed in his image. And because of that, we deserve the wrath of God. Why? Because he is holy and we are not. And his wrath abides on sin. He would not be a just God if he didn't let his wrath abide on sin. But he's also a God of love. And this God of love sent his only begotten son into the world. To be born of a virgin. God made flesh. Who lived sinlessly throughout this life. Didn't sin. You know, I could take a sin test here. How many of you have ever disobeyed your parents? Right? We could do that. You know, if Jesus was sitting here and I'd go, how many of you disobeyed your parents before? And everybody raise your hand, Jesus would be like, <laughs> you know, because he didn't. He lived sinlessly so that he could die in our place. God's perfect lamb, nailed to a cross, who bore the wrath of God that you and I deserved so that he could give to us as a free gift the righteousness of God that we do not deserve. And by his blood, the blood that he shed that day, our sins are washed away. How do we know that sacrifice is enough? Because three days later, on the offering of the first fruits, the first fruits rose from the dead. Jesus alive, showing that God accepted and approved the offering. Showing that his death on the cross is the payment of our sin. His resurrection is the receipt. Paid in full. Waved before the Father as the first fruits, guaranteeing that whoever would place their faith in him and repent of their sin and come into him would be part of that harvest to come. The question is, is that you? Have you received Jesus Christ that way? If you have not, then I beg you, come and talk to me when the service is over. Talk to one of our staff members. So find somebody and say, help me know Jesus. But if you do know Jesus, if you're here and you, you know Jesus, here's my only challenge to you today. Go out there and live like it. <laughs>